morning, everybody. We'll try that one more time. Good morning, everybody. Y'all drink some coffee this morning? Eat your Wheaties? One cup or one pot? Oh, cup. Okay. Okay. Just checking. Just checking. I'd like to welcome you all to the Defenders class. Uh, This is where we uh, study uh, doctrine, what we believe about the scriptures and apologetics, how uh, we defend these Christian truths uh, to others. Uh, I hope you all have been enjoying this class. I know I've enjoyed teaching it. Um, We're kind of at a, I don't want to say a crossroads because that's not really appropriate, Um, But we're at a point where we can transition into a new set of doctrine if we want to. And so I want to get your mind thinking about that this morning. I'm going to leave some time at the end uh, to kind of discuss the direction that we may go. Um, We are still in the doctrine of God and his attributes right now. And I can stay in that for probably the next six months if I wanted to. (laughs) Or we could wrap it up here today. Um, So I'm going to leave that to you all. Uh, I'll throw out a few of the different sets of doctrine that we could hit on. Uh, This is what Pastor Jim was talking about in the last hour. Uh, I really do have enough material to go for the next year. If I wanted to, I could probably go for the next 10 years teaching this. Uh, The depths of God are unsearchable. His character is so immense that we could spend an entire lifetime studying and never get to the bottom of it. Right, Tim? I think we've had conversations like this before. There's just no end to what you can discover whenever you're looking at who God is. And uh, so what we've already covered in the last session um, that wasn't in here, we discussed the doctrine of revelation. Uh, Not the book of Revelation, but how God reveals himself to us. Uh, We've been talking about the doctrine of God and his attributes in here. Uh, We talked about his aseity, his omnipresence, uh, his immutability, his omniscience, his divine foreknowledge, his middle knowledge, omnipotence. We could discuss his holiness, could discuss his love. We could discuss many things about the attributes of God. Uh, We can discuss the doctrine of natural theology uh, that talks about God outside of Scripture, how we can prove his existence. Uh, We can talk about the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, That would be a big, immense study, right? Uh, We can break down the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the church, uh, the doctrine of last things. I have an immense selection to choose from. And so uh, we'll kind of discuss this at the end. I don't want to distract too much from what we're going to be doing here today, but I did want to kind of talk to you about some of that. Uh, Another thing that I hope I'm going to leave enough time for is any questions that you all have over this entire study that we've done so far. Uh, One thing that I did in the past lesson, um, I handed out these little three by five note cards, and I asked people um, just If you have any questions or somebody's asked you a question you didn't know the answer to, write it down and we'll see if we can we can come up with some sort of solution to it. So a few examples here. Show me proof of Jesus. Scripture is not allowed. Uh, I I thought that was pretty good. Um, Why is it that some people can hear the spoken word and some cannot? Uh, So a lot of good a lot of good questions here. How do you know God exists? What makes you think the Bible is true? And how can a good God allow people to suffer? These are all questions that many non-believers have and many believers have as well. And so I'm going to leave room at the end if you want to ask some questions or uh, share something that you may have learned. Uh, At the end, we will do that. Uh, But we're going to go ahead and get into today's lesson. Um, I am going to go over the purposes of this class. I feel like it's necessary Uh, every week. Uh, The first and primary purpose of this class is to train Christians to understand, articulate, and defend basic Christian truths, or in some cases, very advanced Christian truths, right? Number two, we also want to reach out with the gospel to those who have not yet come to know Christ, 
always being ready to give a defense to anyone who would, have a, uh, uh, would ask a reason for our hope. And that's found in 1 Peter 3.15. And the third uh, purpose of this class, we want to be an incendiary fellowship of mutual care and encouragement. And I feel like we're, we're getting to that point. I feel like this is, uh, uh, this is a good uh, class to, to have all these things. Um, today, we are going to be uh, getting into uh, the next part, and I always make some kind of typo, part five, God's omnipresence. So if you have your hand out, you can look. Um, God's presence, his omnipresence, simply means all present, ever present, or God is everywhere. We can think about this in a number of different ways. And I'm going to try to open up your mind to a few things uh, with that. But I want you to begin to think about God as being everywhere. Uh, and I, I want to try to describe everywhere to you, because I, I think a lot of times we, we kind of live in our own bubble. Um, the universe. As far as we know, the universe is gigantic, but it has a limitation to how big it is. Whenever you go out to the very edge of the universe, it is expanding really fast. From everything that we can tell, it is all expanding. And even, even in the Word of God, it says that God stretches out the heavens like a tent, like, like it's just ballooning out in all directions. And it's huge. <laughs> huge. Uh, we form things called galaxies. We're part of a galaxy, and our Milky Way galaxy contains 400 billion stars. Do you all know that? It's a lot, of, a lot of stars, right? God has formed all those, literally spoke those into existence, and that can make you feel really tiny, and we really should feel tiny in comparison to God. But that would be a lot if it was just one galaxy. But it's estimated that there's at least four or five hundred billion galaxies out there. So 400 billion galaxies with 400 billion stars in each one, that should kind of blow your mind a little bit. If you wanted to count to a billion, one, two, three, and get to a billion, it takes something like, like 23 years just to count to 1 billion. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. It, it, it's immeasurable in that sense. We can categorize it like that. But the universe itself is huge, more than we can think or fathom. And I'm saying all this to tell you that God, in some sense, is not only present everywhere in this universe, but he's beyond it. Does that make sense? Not only is he present in all of that creation that he literally spoke into existence, you can think of it like a bubble, and then he's outside of it. So he's present everywhere, and he's present outside of everywhere as well. He's not simply just some part of this universe. That's not the way to think about it. He's not just some part of it. He is, in a sense, beyond everything and a part of everything. But I don't want you to confuse that like God is the universe somehow. That's, that's not the way to think about it either. Uh, but I want you, wanted you to get this awe-inspiring picture of how big the universe is and how that doesn't even scratch the surface of how powerful and how big God is. So we're going to look at a couple things. Uh, we're going to look at some scriptures that kind of prove this. Uh, we're going to look at point number one. Uh, God's presence is everywhere. God's presence is everywhere. <clears throat> the first scripture we're going to look at here is Psalm 139, 7 through 12. It says here, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? And the answer to that question is that there's nowhere that he can go, right? To, to get away from God's presence. Uh, verse 8, 
If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, the proper word there would be Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. <clears throat> if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. <clears throat> what this is getting at is God's presence is everywhere. He is omnipresent. He, he's, he's present in a sense in this, well, I guess it's a fake candle. I thought it was a real candle. That's impressive. He is present in this fake candle. He is present in the floor. He is present in every single square inch of the universe, in a sense. You can't go anywhere where God is not there, where God is not a part of this. We're going to look at Jeremiah 23, 23 through 24 as well. I am a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Uh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago about Adam trying to hide from God, Adam and Eve trying to hide from God. He, he, he felt naked and exposed and didn't want to be in the presence of God, but how silly is that, right? Because obviously God can find them. Uh, if this whole life was a game of hide and seek, God would find you 100% of the time in literally zero seconds <laughs> because he knows where you're at at all times. We're going to look here at 1 Kings 8.27 to kind of confirm this, that God is present everywhere. Uh, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. So what we're getting at now, God's presence is everywhere, but also, in a sense, the universe itself can't even contain God's presence. So we're, we're starting to see things in, in a couple different ways now. God is so big that he will literally fill all the heavens and the earth if he made his presence known. But also, he's somehow present everywhere we go. Y'all awake this morning? Y'all with me? It's confusing to think about this. This is why I saved it for uh, the last of the omnis, <laughs> okay? His omnipresence. Uh, and then we're going to get into Acts 17, and we're going to be seeing a more complete description here. Uh, God who made the world and everything in it, made everything, right? Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Listen to this though he is not far from each one of us. What does that mean? He is not far from each one. Does that mean he's a physical distance away from us? God is not far. He's, he's one fake candle away from us, right? He's, he's one foot away from us. Is that what that means? No, he, he's, he's close to us in a different sense than physical distance. And I hope that's starting to click in your mind, some of those, those things. He's, he's, he's close, but that doesn't necessarily mean he is physically close or far away, because God is present in everything. Uh, we're gonna, I, I love these verses here. Um, For in him we live and move and have our being, uh, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Um, so that is Acts 17, 24 through 28. So uh, I have a couple points that I want to make about God's presence, and then I'm going to ask this question. Uh, it's kind of a trick question. I'm sorry. I'm going to attempt to trick you all this morning. 
Uh, but uh, we're going to get into uh, some of the points to be made here. Uh, number one, God's presence is everywhere, as we've been talking about. But A, we should not think of God as localized in any one earthly spot. We should not think of God as localized in one earthly spot. Um, the church, this is an amazing building, um, but somehow on Sunday mornings, it's not like we get all of God and the rest of the world doesn't have any of his presence. Does that make sense? He, he's not localized here. He's not just here because it says earlier that even the heavens cannot contain all of the presence of God. But somehow he is present in all of the, the true churches who truly worship God throughout all of the planet, throughout all of human existence. He has been able to be present in that sense. So we should not think about God in the same way that we think about ourselves. Kevin Smith is standing right here in this building right now. I'm not somewhere else. I'm localized right here. You can't say the same thing about God. You can actually say the same thing about angels, I believe. Uh, whenever uh, it talks about in Daniel, um, the archangel Michael was, was held up by the prince of Persia for 21 days, I believe is what it said, uh, before he was able to make it to answer Daniel's prayers. To me, that shows that even angels are not omnipresent in that sense. They are localized. They, they have one place that they can be. They can't be all places at all times. But God goes beyond that. He is amazing. He's, he's everywhere. It's amazing. And then the next point I want to make, um, we should not think of God as somehow localized in heaven as well. Uh, I think a lot of our theology revolves around us looking up and seeing the presence of God in heaven like he's like like nowhere else to be found, he's just up there, and he's so far away that, that we'd never be able to reach him. Or that somehow heaven is a place where if we built the right technology, maybe we could get there on our own. But that's not what that means, is it? We shouldn't think of God as somehow just localized in heaven. I think it's a representation of, of who he is, in a sense. It is a real place. But we shouldn't think of God as only limited to being there because he is ever-present everywhere. Y'all follow me this morning? Okay, okay. So let's get to the question, and if you have any questions over this, uh, let's discuss it. Um, this, is a, this is a tricky subject. This is a trippy, tricky <laughs> topic. Um, if God is present everywhere, does that mean that God is present in hell? I want to know your, your thoughts on this. What do you think? That's a good point. She said, it does say God is everywhere, and it's not like somebody else grabbed a, a hammer and some nails and started building hell, right? God had to have created that, in a sense. So, <clears throat> I always think about the verse... Uh, uh, Ashley said, isn't there a scripture that talks about um, your separation from God whenever you're in hell? And I think that is the proper way to look at it. But I really think we have to separate two things with that. And, and I'll, I'll let you start to process that. But God is present everywhere. But also, he can't be in the presence of sin in that sense as well. And also... Uh, there seems to be a very real separation from God. And so we, we, we again, we're on this, we, we got to separate it somehow. <laughs> there, there's got to be a way to think about this. It does say that God is present everywhere. So in some sense, he has to be present in hell. If he wasn't, then it would just cease to exist. And we know that's not the case. Yes, Tom. So I, I, uh, I don't want to forget that I, I'm recording this for our online audience. <clears throat> so I do want to try to clarify. Um, what Tom is saying is, can God be more present in one place and less present in another? Because 
a lot of times we can experience the presence of God in a very real way. Let me ask you this, I guess. Does that mean that that God's presence is somehow less whenever you're not feeling him? No. His presence is unlimited in that sense, so I don't know that you can think about it as like more or less presence. I don't know that you can think about it that way. Maybe you can, but I don't know that that's the proper way to think about it. Do you have something, Connie? So what Connie is saying is on the cross, at the, at the moment where uh, Jesus took on all of that sin, um, God was somehow separated in that sense from the sin. Um, and we have to think about it in, some, in, in terms like that. It, God's presence in, a, in that sense cannot be in the presence of sin. Um, but he's unlimited. He is everywhere. So there, there's, there's got to be some sort of tying together of these two concepts. Yeah, that, that's one of the verses we read. Uh, if, if, if I make my bed in hell, and like I said, the, the word there translated would be Sheol, the grave, the, the netherworld, the afterlife. And in the Old Testament, all people went to Sheol in that sense. And I think there's some theology there that can be clarified. But um, even if you go down there, right, we think up and down, God is present. So that just answers it. God's in hell. No. <laughs> Hold up. That just doesn't sound right, does it? Can God withhold his presence? That's almost one of those um, abilities that we talked about um, that kind of contradicts itself, right? If God is ever present, can he be, not be present somewhere? In a sense, that might be like, can God create a married bachelor? Maybe it just doesn't make sense the way we think about it like that. Yes, and so what she was saying is, is uh, God does dwell in, in temples in a sense, and now we are the temple, and God can dwell within us. Uh, but also, the scripture said, God can fill the entire heavens and the earth. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm just going to. I'm gonna try um, to get through this because this is a very complicated thing to think about. I do, I do want you to think about it like this. Um, this is a very complicated thing to think about. Um. I think we need to look at it in two different ways. There's the physical side of things, where literally God can be present everywhere. But there's also a relational presence that Scripture talks about all throughout Scripture. Um, whenever we are near to God, does that mean we are physically closer to God in some way? No, it doesn't, does it? It, it means that God is dwelling, in a sense, more in us. But you can't really think about that because God's presence if he were to fully dwell in us, we'd probably explode, right? <laughs> That's not the way to think about it. He can become close to us whenever we develop our relationship with him. So there's another level, like, like the physical is one thing. Um, he can be present everywhere. But there's an even deeper level to which God is closer or further away. Um, we can think about that like, like heaven. Um, are we... Are we looking forward to going to heaven? Is that what you're looking forward to? Or are you looking forward to being in a deeper presence with God? Those are two wholly separate things, and I hope you see that. I hope you're not just going to heaven, because <laughs> you've missed the point, if that's the case. Would you want to go to heaven if God wasn't there? That beats the alternative. <laughs> Thank you for that, Tom. <laughs> Beats the alternative. So I think we can think about it in terms of God is physically present everywhere. But whenever it comes to a spiritual presence, remember we talked about his incorporeality. God is not a physical being in that sense. He can be more or less present 
spiritually in that sense, his impact can be made known more, is I think how we need to think about it. Um, And there is separation that happens when we sin. There is eternal separation that can happen when we reject God's plan for our lives. Um, And I know that probably doesn't necessarily adequately explain (laughs) everything that you're hoping, but I do have a quote here. Um, I accidentally put it in the wrong place. Uh, This is from uh, somebody named William Lane Craig. And uh, I, I look through many different sources, but one of the main sources of just how to outline all this comes from some of his teachings. Um, he says this, I am more inclined to the view to say that God simply transcends space. In that case, what omnipresence amounts to is that God is cognizant, aware of, and causally active at every point in space. That is what omnipresence means. It doesn't mean that God is literally in space. Rather, God transcends space, but he knows what is happening at every point in space, and he is causally active at every point in space, causing things to happen there and causally sustaining them in existence. So God, on this conception, is a non-spatial, transcendent, infinite mind who is conscious of and active at every point point in space. That's a lot. If you all want to get out your phones and take a picture of that, or I can send that to you, uh, here's the first part of the verse. Um, What that means is that God doesn't necessarily have to be physically present to be causally active. I I used the illustration last week. Um, If I wanted to get rid of this pew, uh, like completely destroy it. There's a number of ways that I could think about doing that, but God is causally active at every point in space, so he can be active in the armrest here the same way he can be in the cushion and just erase it from existence. He could do that. Um, So he can cause and affect things at every point in space, but he doesn't necessarily physically exist there. Here's the second part. I I think I've stalled long enough for you all to get a snap picture of that if you wanted to. Here's the second part of that verse. God transcends space. Um, Does that make sense? Or is that just muddying the waters even more? It must have made perfect sense. Must have made perfect sense. Um, We will get to some questions. I want to go over two things really quickly about the practical application of God's omnipresence. Um, The first practical uh, application is that we can contact God at any location. Um, If I moved to, I don't know, Maine, would I be leaving God? Or would he be just as present in my life in Maine as he is right here in Potosi? If somebody got a call to uh, go to Bolivia, well, God's obviously not as powerful and as strong in Bolivia as he is in Potosi, right? No. We can can contact God at any location. And I I think um, from talking with a few missionaries and things like that, I think sometimes they think, I I don't, they subconsciously think this, like somehow I'm not going to be as connected with God if I go here. But that's not the case at all. Anywhere we go, uh, if, if we somehow enter into the Star Wars world and we can go between galaxies somehow, uh, God is present wherever we go, and we can reach him anywhere we go. Uh, it says, uh, this is found in the, uh, the book of Matthew at the end, the Great Commission. You all should be familiar with this. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee... To the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When he saw, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you sometimes. 
Oh, it says always, right? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. There's nowhere you can go physically where you cannot contact God. That is a practical application of God's omnipresence. And the second thing, we should always be aware of the presence of God. Uh, I, was, I was talking to somebody earlier, they asked, how are you? And I said, nervous, <laughs> because I get nervous speaking in front of people. Um, and I don't know why I do that. Uh, I, I have to step back and realize that the presence of God can be made known even whenever I speak, especially whenever I speak. And so I have to empty myself somehow and allow God to make room to work in my life. But always being aware of the presence of God allows us to understand God's power is at hand within us whenever we surrender to him and that he is always close in that sense. Not spatially, not like I'm close to this fake candle, but in a more material, not in a material sense, in a more spiritual sense. And I want to say this as well. The only time God is distant, it's not on God, it is on us. See, God doesn't move anywhere in that sense. We will create the distance, distance from him. We have like 15 minutes to, to go over any kind of questions or anything like that. I know that was kind of word vomit and uh, very quickly a very difficult top to, topic to cover. But I do want to open it up for any other questions, comments, concerns, or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, Brother Tim was saying, is, uh, he mentioned Louis Giglio um, in some of his videos. He talks about the, the vastness of the universe and... Um, I believe you mentioned that, that God is bigger than that, right? But in a sense, God is beyond measuring him in space. So we, it's hard to even look, it, it's hard to even think about God like that because you, you can't measure him like that. He, he's literally outside of those things, just like time. We take for granted that we have a relationship to time. Like we can't, make time move any faster or slower. But God is not bound by time, right? So we, we almost can't think about God like that. Like, like God's not a certain amount of years old. He's an infinite in the past, and he will be infinite in the future. God's not somehow something that can be measured with a stick in any physical sense. He, he's beyond that. We may be able to measure the universe because it's all contained in what he created. Um, and his presence is at the same time so big that it fills all of it, but it also can't be contained within it. So it's just, it's pretty amazing to think about it. Kind of, it should blow your mind a little bit. <laughs> or a lot of bit, depending on how you're thinking about it. Any other responses, questions? It can be about anything, Yes. So, what I'm thinking, uh, what she asks is, is whenever you uh, get to the scripture where, where God was somehow separated at the cross, uh, he can't be in the presence of sin, so how can he be present in hell? Um, I think that definition that, that I put up there that I asked you to take a picture of, I think it kind of solves that in the sense of God being all present everywhere doesn't mean that he is physically there. Rather, he has the power to be active at any point in space. Not only that, he sustains all things, right? We, we read that in Colossians. Uh, uh, all things were created through him and for him, and in him all things consist. All things hold together in that sense. So I believe if God stopped, stopped being causally present somewhere, that thing would just cease to exist. Um, I don't know if that answers what, you, what you're thinking, but I, I think it's more of a spiritual presence. It's that, it's that, I keep doing this, but it's like a higher sense of the way to think about it. Like there's material, 
and he's present, he's active everywhere, but there's something even beyond that because he communicates with us in a, in a totally different way that we can't measure. He, he connects with us spiritually. And whenever we're not connected with him spiritually, Scripture has many phrases for that, but one of them is dead in our trespasses. We're literally dead in some sense without the presence of God in our lives. But that doesn't mean that God's somehow physically distant. It's hard to think about. It really is. And it almost seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Yeah, well, well, now is the time to ask. Yes. Let me, try to, let me try to summarize that, and I always put a spin on it, I guess, in my own way, but what Jacqueline was talking about is Psalm 139. If you think about it in the context, there's nowhere he can go where God can't see him in that sense. And, and so the context of that is him moving physically through different places. Um, but she also brought up another verse, um, who am I that you should be mindful of me? I'm, I'm nothing. Why, why, why even think about me, God? Why even consider me? Uh, and I think that's the proper relation that we should have. Like, we, we, we're not deserving of, of, of God, really. We're not. Um, and it's only through God that he makes a way for us to be in relation to him. Uh, the other point she made is that she can be physically present here at church, and not be spiritually present. Have y'all ever felt like that at church? It's, it's just Jacqueline. Y'all are perfect saints all the time, right? And so, I, I see, just a second, the, the, the concept is you can be somewhere physically, but not be there spiritually, if that makes sense. And I think in the same sense, that's how we can separate God's omnipresence in a way. He, he can be causally active everywhere physically, but he is not necessarily made manifest. And, and th- there's, a, there's a whole theology, I'm sure you've heard of this, um, talking about the Shekinah glory of God, right? That fills the temple and his presence dwells there. Um, you know, it, and I think that's in a sense like a, like a very spiritual manifestation of God being present there. And just like you were talking about, we, we have this, we in a sense are now the temple. And the Shekinah glory, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the power of God in that sense can dwell within us somehow. But it can't be physically or else it'd be just like I talked about last week. You'd be like a ticking time bomb of TNT. You know, you'd be like if you contain the full power of God, you'd just like blow everything up on contact. So, so. Tom was saying that he, he listened to a sermon this week about, about worry in the sense like um, where if you worry, then basically you're sinning. And, and I would agree with that to some point because, because of these very practical applications, right, that I've been talking about. We can contact God at any location. Uh, we should always be aware of the presence of God. And if you're worrying, in some sense, you're limiting God you're creating an idol out of whatever it is that you're worrying about because somehow um, being in front of a whole crowd of people has now become bigger than the presence of God. That's where my worry comes from. And that's why I tell you every, every week, like it's, it's a, God never stops working in our lives, right? God, God always connects us with his presence. And in that sense, I can I have to develop that sense of trust in him each and every day. And I think that's what you're getting at. You, you're trying to put into practical application that, that you shouldn't worry about anything. If God is big enough, then why worry, right? Yeah, yeah. So some of these, th- this is what I'm hoping to accomplish through these practical applications is that, like, it's not just some lofty idea like God is present everywhere. It's not like we don't have to think about that. You have to think about that every day in your life for any situation. God is there. And the only reason that he's not spiritually closer to you is not on his end. <laughs> it's on your end. Just like uh, Pastor Jim will preach about here today. I, I, I love this sermon today. He talks about God actively pursuing you <laughs> because he loves you that much. And we're not incapable of that. Connie, did you have something? 
So in that story, the rich man and Lazarus, uh, Lazarus is poor. He's, he's waiting for crumbs to fall uh, just so he can eat the crumbs that would be left for the dogs. Uh, he's, he's waiting for that to fall from the rich man's plate. They both die, and Lazarus is comforted in a, in a place called paradise, or Abraham's bosom is the way that Scripture describes that. And the rich man is separated in a, in a very real place, uh, Sheol, <laughs> in a sense. And the rich man has communication, and in the story, it's not with God, it is with Father Abraham, is the way they describe it, with Abraham himself. And the rich man is saying, listen, um, just dip your finger in a drop of water to quench this thirst, just just one little drip, because I'm in such torment and suffering. And Abraham talks about there being a great chasm fixed in between them where you can't pass from one to the other or anything like that. Uh, I have a whole um, theology that would probably take me about an hour to get through <laughs> with that. Um, I understand where you're coming from with it. In some sense, they have to be present, right, to be able to communicate. But I, I think that was just a helpful story to get us through that. Um, I think uh, if you further look at the doctrine of hell, if you look, do a word search, uh, for hell and look up the original definitions of it because it's not just one blanket word. There was Sheol in the Old Testament. There's Hades in the New Testament. There's a word called Tartarus, which is only found once that describes hell. Uh, there's a place called uh, Gehenna, which is even different. There's a place called the Outer Darkness, and we lump all those things into hell. If you, if you, if you look at the New King James, if you look at the Old King James, it's all hell. <laughs> But there's distinctions in there, and I think we can have a deeper theology with that. I don't even know if you were going that direction, but that's, um, that's where my mind just went. That bowl of spaghetti noodles coming out again. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Any comments of where you might... Would you like to stay in the attributes another couple weeks? Or would you like to move on? Yes. So what Miss Sandy was saying is, is we, we somehow limit God... Uh, in almost every way, because we're, we're human, and that's the only way we can help to think about God. Um, somehow we've got to develop a better understanding, and that'll take a lifetime. And we th- even then, at that point, will not have a full understanding of God. It's only whenever we get to a deeper presence with God that we're going to understand Him more completely. He's going to dwell in a different sense among us. Um, and, and it's going to be amazing. Um, I was just having that conversation with Miss Debbie earlier about that, um, how uh, all these different attributes of God, learning about them, um, strengthens my faith, and that, that box that I keep God in is kind of growing bigger and bigger and bigger. We can't help but put him in a box. I can't help but put him in a box of my anxiety or my worries or my what, you name it, whatever we struggle with, we, we, we somehow keep him in a box. But hopefully, it, and the amazing thing is that God understands that we're limited in understanding who he is. And so the more we submit to him, the bigger our concept of God gets, the more faith we can have in him, and the deeper our relationship can go. And I hope, hope with that it spills out into every other person in our lives. Think about somebody who you know who may be struggling with worry or anxiety or things like that, Tom could just say, you know what? God is so much bigger than that. Let me explain to you how big God is. And if you really understand that, you won't worry about anything, right? Because every little thing is going to be all right, right? Is that the song you quoted from earlier? Uh, we, are, we are officially out of time, and so we're going to go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, I think I may continue on in the the attributes of God for at least a couple more weeks. I I do want to touch on God's holiness. I think that's very important, and uh, so we'll at least get to that. Uh, If you all have any questions, feel free to ask them, but we'll go ahead and dismiss in a word of prayer. Father, we are just so thankful for your power and your presence. Uh, Lord, I pray that you could take uh, what I've said here today, straighten it out, Uh, Do as only you can do and just awaken our minds and our hearts 
to know you better. I pray that each and every one of us would honestly seek you wherever we're at. And I pray, Father, that what we've learned here today would create in us a hunger and a thirst for you and your word and a desire to share who you are with everybody that we come into contact with. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to expand our view of who you are. We limit you. That's all we can do because we're limited. But Father, I pray that you would just continue to just blow our minds with who you are and that we could take that knowledge and just share it with everybody. Uh, Father, just awaken in us a hunger and a desire for you and your word, and I pray that you just be with us uh, as we go throughout this week. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you all.